Um, I want to invite you to open up your, your Bibles to the book of Micah. And if you go, Micah who? Or where is that? The Bible, it's there in your pew. It's between the book of Jonah and the book of Nahum. And if you go, that doesn't help me at all. <laughs> Then there's this table of contents in your Bible right in the beginning that'll tell you the page number for the book of Micah. As you're finding it, you can also use your phone or tablet with the instructions that are on the screen. You can go right to Micah chapter 1. I want to acknowledge as you look around our sanctuary for one last time these decorations that have marked the season of Advent and Christmas. Because yesterday, don't know if you know this, yesterday January 6th was the 12th day of Christmas. You know the song? It was the 12th day of Christmas yesterday, which means the official end to the Christmas season, and that means that today is Epiphany Sunday. Uh, that 12th day is known by the Brits as Twelfth Night. You may have heard that before. We call it Epiphany, and Epiphany is a Greek word that means manifestation. A more modern definition of the word Epiphany goes something like this. It's a sudden manifestation or perception of the essential nature of or meaning of something. In its original Christian context, the epiphany characterizes the revelation of God through the humanity of Jesus Christ. And traditionally, churches spend um, today reflecting on biblical stories that relate to this idea of epiphany. The two most common ones that you would hear would be the visit of the Magi, the wise men, which you can see up here in our nativity scene, to the Christ child, that epiphany through the star of uh, the, the, the message of God to the Gentiles. But another story that's often uh, talked about today is the public baptism of Jesus by his cousin John, as that was also a revelation of God indicating this is my son in whom I am well pleased. I tell all of that to give you some background. We are not looking at either one of those uh, today. Um, we are, it's obviously in the flavor of this service, but instead today we are going to be um, getting to our epiphany by way of the prophet Micah. And I, I promise you today and actually through this series that we're starting on the book of Micah, we will find ourselves coming to an epiphany in the sense of a greater appreciation for our need as well as God's grace in coming to us in Jesus Christ. Before we dive in, a little background here. Micah is the 33rd book of the Bible. It's the sixth part of what is known as the Book of Twelve, and that is just referring to the 12 minor prophets. You've probably heard this before, but it bears repeating when we say minor prophets. It's not referring to their significance as if they're less significant. Minor versus major prophets refers to the length of the book. So Isaiah, Jeremiah are long books. They're major prophets, where Micah, uh, Amos, uh, Amos, Hosea are shorter, and they tend to be, therefore, the minor prophets. Micah's name is actually shortened. It's a, a shortened form of Micaiah, and his name means who is like the Lord. And that really is a good question to kind of keep in the back of your mind as we go through his book, because he seeks to answer that question. He was from a town, a little village called Morasheth, and uh, Morasheth, just to give you some geography, was in the hill country of Judah. It was a village about 20... 20 miles or so southwest of Jerusalem. Uh, Micah was not a prophet who spoke alone. He was a contemporary. He was speaking at the same time as Isaiah and Hosea. He prophesied, in fact, in the midst of the divorce. I don't know if you remember your Bible history. The divorce of Israel, the people of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, into two kingdoms. They had a little bit of a, they had a, a pretty serious split and became two kingdoms, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Specifically, Micah served the Lord more in the southern kingdom during the 8th century B.C. during the reigns of three kings, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, who were all kings in the south of Judah. So with that background, let's enter and read a little bit from chapter 1. I will warn you, as your Bibles are open, um, as often is the case with the prophets, this isn't exactly the most uplifting stuff. So prepare yourself accordingly. Let's hear from Micah chapter 1. It reads, The word of the Lord that came to Micah, son of, Morish, uh, of Morasheth, excuse me, during the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. The vision he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear, you peoples, all of you, listen earth and all who live in it, that the sovereign Lord may bear witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. Look, the Lord is coming down from his dwelling place. He comes down and treads on the heights of the earth. The mountains melt beneath him and the valleys split apart like wax before fire, like water rushing down a slope. All this is because of Jacob's transgression, because of the sins of the people of Israel. What is Jacob's transgression? Is it not Samaria? Is what is Judah's high place? Is it not Jerusalem? Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap of rubble, a place for planting vineyards. I will pour her stones into the valley and lay bare her foundations. 
All her idols will be broken to pieces. All her temple gifts will be burned with fire. I will destroy all her images. Since she gathered her gifts from the wages of prostitutes, as the wages of prostitutes, they will again be used. Because of this, I will weep and wail. I will go about barefoot and naked. I will howl like a jackal and moan like an owl. For Samaria's plague is incurable. It is spread to Judah. It has reached the very gate of my people, even to Jerusalem itself. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Most of us don't listen to warnings. You notice that? Most of us don't listen to warnings. There are traffic signs that we encounter every day all over the place that warn us to slow down or to stop. Billboards popping up all over the place telling us not to text while we are behind the wheel to click it or tick it and not to drive once we've had something to drink. But unless we get pulled over, unless we get a ticket, or God forbid worse, we have an accident, I like how we call it an accident, or a wreck, we ignore these warnings, don't we? We get notices from our insurance companies and our doctors about annual wellness checks and other precautionary medical tests that are prescribed for us. Quick show of hands, how many of you actually get any of these wellness checks or pre do these things? Ooh, good for you. How many of you have had your flu shot? How many of you have not? There, uh, there you go, there we go. How many of you have ever read the labels on the food you eat? or the beverages you drink? And how many of you have ever put that food down or that beverage down because of what's on those labels? How many of you have said, ah, whatever, and there you go, there you go, there you go. How many of you have had prescriptions filled and you've uh, paid attention to all of the side effects that are listed on the back? How many of you have done that because you've had something happen to you and so therefore you're like, never again? And then for the rest of us, it's like, ah, oh, it'll be fine, right? We pay little attention to the warnings that are all around us. We eat and drink what we want, and I, I will confess this. Most of us, I think I've said this with the pre-wellness checks, but how many of you only go to the doctor when you have no other choice? Like literally the last thing you will possibly do. Yes, right here, okay. You know, added to this, this idea that we don't pay attention to warnings. I was reading this a couple of weeks ago, and it stayed with me, that um, statistically we know, it's shocking actually, many workplace deaths are the result of on-the-job accidents that are totally preventable. Did you know that? Most of them are totally preventable. Project managers, supervisors, maybe you, you are one, maybe you're on a job site like, like this, they train and review with their employees mandatory safety rules, right? And then their warnings and instructions are completely disregarded and bad things happen. Or finally, consider for me the most prevalent example of not listening to warnings. And I want you to be totally honest right now. The last time you flew on an airplane, how many of you actually paid attention to the safety announcements being given at the, begin at the beginning of the flight? How many of you actually paid attention? How many of you had your headphones in, were reading something else? How many of you were like, when are they going to be done with this? Right? Think about that. Just think about that for a second. I, mean, I would argue most people I look around on planes are not paying attention to the pre-flight safety announcements. But think about this, okay? Our lives may depend on what's being shared in those few brief minutes, right, before takeoff, in, in just those few minutes before suddenly we are thousands of feet in the air, right, above the earth, in the hands of a handful of people who are flying the plane. And yet, for most of us, you look around, people are not every time they get on a plane going, okay, let's go over it. What is it? It's interesting. We don't pay attention to warnings. The words emergency and caution can be plastered all over the place, but they really don't catch our attention unless the warning sign is critical. Unless the fasten your seatbelt sign comes on and you start to experience a little turbulence until the oxygen mass drops and all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, where's the exit? Where's the seat cushion? That thing floats, right? We don't pay attention to warning signs. And I bring this up because as we were reading chapter one, and if you keep your Bible open and keep reading it, Actually, this goes on even to chapter 2. The opening chapters of Micah serve as a warning. They are a word of caution about a terrible judgment that is coming. If you were reading with me, Micah warns that God is not blind. 
The Lord is not ignorant about what is happening among his people. Micah warns God is not absent. The Lord is coming down from heaven. He's about to show up on the earth, just like Yahweh did back in the day at Mount Sinai. The only big difference is, is that time God was making a covenant with his people, and now, 500 years, after 500 years of disobedience, the Lord is coming to enforce that covenant. Micah warns that no one escapes the scrutiny of God's judgment. No one is beyond the Lord's power as he paints this lavish picture of mountains melting like wax and valleys being split open like water rushing down a steep ravine. The picture is one of God leveling the playing field of his creation that has become crooked and wayward. And as you heard, Micah's word of caution is addressed to Samaria and to Jerusalem. Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom, And Jerusalem was the capital of the southern kingdom of Judah. And this message, though, is not just addressed to them. The message is called out to Samaria and Jerusalem because these two cities represent the nation as a whole, even though it's been divided. And these two cities, as you heard, have become bywords for rebellion and corruption. And as the capital goes, so goes the rest of the nation. And and Micah, we didn't keep going, but if you keep going in chapter 1, all that has gone wrong is so rampant. All that has happened is so insidiously widespread that even as Micah goes on in chapter 1, smaller towns and villages surrounding these capital cities have been affected. Micah lists city after city. Some of these towns still exist today in Israel. Some have been lost to history. And what's interesting, if you pay attention to that list of cities, is you notice something. I I, I hinted at this at the beginning. Micah is more of a country preacher than a cosmopolitan one. He comes from a small town and village. And if you go back and look at that list, one of the cities coming under judgment is Micah's own hometown. What Micah is, in essence, saying, in other words, through this prophetic prophetic warning, what he's communicating is, hey, I'm in the same boat as you. This affects all of us. But what's gone wrong? What... Why the warning? Why the coming reckoning? And we're told in verse 7, the specific issue is called out in verse 7, and it's this, idolatry. Worshiping that which is not God. Idolatry. Elevating to prominence as a matter of focus and dedication, something above and beyond the Lord, the creator and sustainer of all life and being. And if you're looking still at verse 7, you'll see that in the word, with the word of idols and carved images is also paired the word wages. And this is a way of Micah calling out how Israel, what Israel has paid to these false gods. Israel has used her resources to serve these idols. Israel has freely given, in other words, her time, her talent, her treasure, given the things given to her by the Lord, and therefore deserving only to be used to the glory and honor of God. Israel has taken her time, her talent, and her treasure, and given it to that which is not God, to that which did not deserve, was not worthy of such honor and glory. You may have caught in the midst of this this diagnosis, the use of the word high places. That comes up a lot in the biblical prophets. High places is a code word. It doesn't just refer to merely mountaintops. High places is a code word for idolatry. High places referred to the locations of mountain sanctuaries, man-made mountain sanctuaries that were built where sacrifices and other acts of worship were made towards these rival and false gods. And to take you back to a little bit of biblical history here, just again to give you some more context, when Israel split, the northern kingdom had a long history of idol worship. It's not an exaggeration to say for the 210 years the northern kingdom existed, the people did not worship the Lord singularly and properly once. Because of their separation, their divorce as a unified nation, the leaders of the northern kingdom decided it would be better for the people to worship golden statues of calves rather than to direct their eyes to cross over to the southern kingdom to worship the Lord at the temple in Jerusalem. Not one king, not one priest, not one leader, save the prophet sent by God himself in the northern kingdom refrained from idolatry. But you heard, this isn't just a northern issue. This isn't just a Samaria problem. Notice how this is also addressed to Jerusalem. Notice how Jerusalem is specifically referred to as a high place. Don't miss this, given what I just told you. In the very city of David, where the presence of the Lord once dwelt, where God's house was, the place that bore the Lord's name 
alternative, rival and false altars for sacrifice and worship had been built and were frequented over and above the temple of the Lord. And with that in mind, now you can maybe hear the mocking irony in Micah's word of warning. Notice how in the midst of all these high places, Micah says that God has to step down. God has to step down in order to tread on these so-called high places of the earth. The false glory and empty promise of the greatest heights created by humanity will become clear as the Lord tramples, levels these rival sanctuaries. The made-up gods of men will melt and be washed away by the power of the everlasting truth of the Lord. This is all the background. This is all the context. And let's be honest, this stinks. This is, uh, this is like one of those passages, once I finish reading it in front of you, I'm like, oh my gosh, do we have to keep reading this? Isn't it easy to read this and just to be turned off, just to be depressed? I mean, you got up, you got yourself put together, and you made it here on Sunday for this? Isn't this why most of us don't read the prophets, right? Been there, done that? Man, that's one just depressing ride. It's such a downer. But we need to be careful not to miss the point. Why is Micah in our Bible? Why is Micah something we can't just skip over? Because while judgment is coming, and this is a warning, it's not just a word of warning, it's not just a word of caution for them. I don't know how carefully you were listening, how carefully you were paying attention, but if your Bibles are still open, listen to what Micah says in verse two, right out of the gate. Hear, you peoples, all of you, Listen, O earth, and all that is in it, and let the Lord God be a witness against you. This is a message for all the world to hear. This is a warning not just for Israel and Judah. This is a word of caution for all nations, all peoples as well. And again, that, this presents another tragic irony that's at place here. Again, back to the story which we spent all of last year looking at, the biblical story. Remember, I don't know if this, you remember this, but when God was forming Israel from a people into a nation, one of the things that we consistently saw as God was forming Israel from a people into a nation is he continued as he was doing so to point to his discipline of the Canaanites. Do you remember this? He pointed to his discipline of the Canaanites. And what was the primary issue with the Canaanites? Idolatry. And as God was forming Israel from a people into a nation, he pointed to them as a warning, as a caution. Don't live like that. Don't be like that. Don't do that. And now things have come full circle, haven't they? Because now Israel is a nation, a divided nation, and now God, as their heavenly father, prepares to discipline them as, their fa- as the, his favored child. The very nation he called into being to be a light unto the world, the Lord admonishes in front of the rest of his children, us, the rest of the nations on the planet, as a way of saying, pay attention, heed what is happening here. Heed this warning, because this isn't just about them. This also has to do with you. The word of caution against idolatry isn't just for Israel and for Judah, it's for all of us. (laughs) Again, this doesn't make this any more appealing this morning, right? I, wanna, I, I felt led by the Lord to preach on Micah after Christmas, and I want to confess that I didn't really start to look at this till after we got through Christmas, and I got, last week was just a rough week for me, man. You know, it's, it was good to talk about the stuff of Christmas, and then I opened up Micah chapter 1, all right, let's dig in, and I'm like, I don't want to read this, let alone preach on this. I don't know what I've got here other than to go, be warned, repent. Right? But we, we don't want to miss something. And, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm being honest. It was actually like, a, it was a, just a rough 24 hours of just going, I got nothing. Well, I got something, but I don't like what I've got. <laughs> what, I, what I've got. Right? And here it is. I didn't see it at first. I, I read Micah chapter 1, let alone going on. And, I, and at first I just heard just, just a word of just harsh judgment, a word of condemnation, you know, and, and just something that, I, I, like I said, I don't want to hear, let alone I want to share. But then I realized what I was missing. And what, I'm, what we're missing is Micah's message here is not a word of condemnation as much as it is, as I said, a word of warning, a word of caution. And, and if you stop and think about that, 
Why do we give warnings? Why do we offer words of caution? We give them as an aid, don't we? We give them as a help to another person. When we caution someone, right, when we warn them, we're trying to get their attention to change their direction as a a way of avoiding their pain and suffering. Those boring announcements on the airline that the flight attendants give us is designed so that if something happens, we don't die, right? They're warning us to help us. When we see danger on the horizon, when we see trouble ahead, it's when we don't say something, right? When it's when we don't give the other person a heads up, hey, watch out, that we can be accused of seeking or contributing to their harm, right? That's when someone turns and says, why didn't you warn me? Why didn't you tell me that was going to happen? So what we have here, as much as it's not very palatable or we don't like it, is the Lord speaks through Micah not because God wishes to see the death and destruction befall his people. The Lord speaks through Micah because desire, God desires for his people to avoid the trouble ahead. And so with this shift, the opening words of Micah, these words of warning by God, are actually a means of grace. They're an opportunity for correction In other words, the operating premise behind God's prophetic word is we have choices. We are responsible for our choices. We are responsible for where we put our trust, for what and in whom we put our worship. Are we hearing the warning and the caution this morning? And it may be difficult because we don't really have literal high places, right? I mean, we don't build these alternative sanctuaries where we perform sacrifices or worship services like they did back in the day. It's not like we have in our day and age specific images or handcrafted totems that we bound down to, right? But that doesn't mean we're not engaged in idolatry. Remember the definition of an idol, biblically. An idol is anything more important to us than our relationship with God. When something, anything other than God, so dominates our attention, so dominates our passion, so dominates our imagination, so dominates our energy, we are worshiping or idolizing something or someone. Whatever has above God the bulk of your attention, your energy, your passion, your imagination, that has become an idol in your life. That is something you are worshiping. And, you know, it's almost easier to read about idolatry back in the day because, again, it's very, very, you know, it's like, oh, well, obviously, you know, it's it's just inherently bad. You know, they built these these, these, uh, altars in these high places and they did horrific things. You know, they sacrificed children and all kinds of other gross things they did there. You know, when you carve an image and you bow down before it, I mean, obviously that's stupid. That definition of idolatry is is easier for us to manage, but if you truly embrace the full definition, biblical definition of idolatry, an idol is making any aspect of creation. Think about this. Any aspect of creation, the natural world, the home you live in, the resources you have, your career, your appearance, your health, your material possessions, even your marriage, your children, your family. Idolatry is when we make any of it, all of it, into an ultimate thing, an ultimate thing. And what do I mean by an ultimate thing as we continue to unpack this? I'm going to get a little philosophical here. What do I mean by an ultimate thing? Think about the fact that every human being, every community like ours, every nation, every culture is rooted in some ultimate conviction and pursuit. Every Person, every community, every nation, every culture has at its core something that defines its identity, its significance, its purpose, right? And we, know, and we recognize this. We live in a very unique and diverse world. We look across the room and many of us are unique from each other. Our, our country is unique from other countries. Cultures are unique from each other. But here's the thing. Here's the way it's supposed to work. Here's the way it was created. In the midst of all that uniqueness and diversity, which is God-given, We are to be defined. We are to be centered. We are to be united to find our meaning, our shared meaning and destiny in and out of our relationship with our creator, the Lord God. In the midst of all the uniqueness and diversity, that's the the, the binding thread. Idolatry shatters, cuts that thread. Because idolatry is defining and building our lives, building this world on anything, even a good thing, more or other than God. 
Do you hear that? Idolatry, and a lot of us don't think of it this way. Idolatry isn't just always doing something bad. Idolatry is turning good things into bad things. I mean, if you stop and let your mind, and that's what I'm hoping you're doing, your mind is starting to get caught up in this. We can and we do make anything into an idol these days. We can and we do make anything into an idol these days. Economic success can become an idol for us. Romance can become an idol for us. Popularity, status can become an idol for us. Beauty, our politics, the state, military might, science, technology. These are all good things, but they can become idols for us. The human intellect, ethnic pride, the possibilities are endless. Idolatry isn't just about bad things. It's about taking good things and making them into bad things. How does that happen? How can we take something good and make it into something bad? It's this. When we take what God gives us, all those things that I just listed and so much more, when we take what God gives us and we make it ultimate, when we make it the center of our lives, when we ask it, when we demand of it, when we depend upon it to give us our identity, our significance, our security, our safety, our sense of fulfillment, we have turned something good into a false God. We are asking what we have turned into an idol to give us what only God can provide. Our sense of self and significance, our security and direction, our fulfillment. As Micah teases out here, and he'll keep going, the problem of idolatry isn't just that it's a personal affront to God. It is. It's God engages us relationally, personally. But it's not like like God's like, not fair, they like that more than me. That's not the problem of idolatry. The problem of idolatry where it's a personal affront to God is it offends, the offense of the Lord is that idolatry sabotages truth and love. Do you ever think about that? That's why it offends God because idolatry sabotages truth and love. God is truth, amen? Amen. Right? Through the revelation of his character and his will, the Lord seeks to reveal, to manifest truth in our lives and in his creation. That is the essence of God. God is truth. God seeks to reveal and sharing with us his character, his will. What's true? This is truth. Idols distort truth. Idols distort reality. They distort our perception, our understanding, and therefore our practice of what is true. Right? We also say God is love. Amen? God is love. God reveals himself to us and his will for us in all creation out of love. God desires for us to experience his love, to be truly and fully loved. And out of that true and full love he has for us to truly and fully love ourselves and each other. In fact, it's only out of God's love that we can love ourselves rightly and love each other. Idols distort that love. Idols warp and corrupt the balance of our relationship with God, with ourselves, and with others. And here's why. Because idols cannot give us love. Think about that. Idols cannot give us love. No idol can ever fulfill us. Idols can only consume us and shatter our relationships. Idols only can consume us and shatter our relationships. Let me give you two examples. When you look for your career to save you, and I'm not going to name names, but I look around this room and I'm willing to bet that some of you here have been down this road or are there right now. When you look for your career to save you, whether it's a career out in the corporate world or whether it's your career as a parent, as a student, when you look for your career to save you, you will become addicted to your work. You will become, as we say, the job. You will become the job. Think about that. Ironically, you will become the job rather than the job being a means for living the life you were meant for. When you seek salvation in a relationship, and again, looking around the room, not naming names, I'm willing to bet that some of you have been down this road. Some of you may be living in this space right now. When you are seeking salvation in a relationship with a lover, a friend, a parent, your son or daughter, grandchildren, whoever, when you seek salvation in a relationship, that relationship will become imbalanced and unhealthy. 
It will become a relationship marked by anxiety, a relationship marked by obsessiveness, a relationship marked by envy, a relationship marked by resentment. And I would be remiss, though I don't want to go here, if I didn't say I know this from personal experience. I'm not going to name names. I'm not going to be that transparent, but I'm going to confess to you that in my life, I had a very important, significant relationship, a relationship that meant a lot to me, means a lot to me, as all relationships that are worth their salt do, that I didn't realize for the longest time had become an idol for me. And it wasn't like I was, every time I saw that person, I kissed their ring or bowed down to them or, you know, I was praying to them, <laughs> you know, or I had their picture up in my house, you know. It was a relationship that meant a lot to me. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's good. Relations, people, other people should mean something to you. But over time, as we grew closer, I put more attention, more weight, more significance into that relationship. I needed that relationship. I needed that person to validate my identity. I needed that relationship to, mer to justify my significance. I needed that relationship to, to uh, celebrate, to affirm my success. And what started to happen is I thought all the time, I obsessed all the time about that relationship, played over every conversation, read every facial expression, every word, the tone. I was continually envious and resentful. First, I would, say, would be very passive aggressive in trying to get my message across. Then I was very upfront. Then I'd be punitive and pull back. All what was driving me is I wanted this person to do what I wanted them to do. I wanted them to act the way I wanted them to back, act. I needed them to be a certain way for it to be okay, for us to be okay, for me to be okay. Angry, obsessed, resentful. And we grew apart. And I only got more angry. And I only got more obsessed. And I only got more resentful. It was consuming me, eating me up. And they pulled away because it was hurting them. And all of a sudden, by the grace of God, I realized that I had tried to make this person my salvation. And I'm going to tell you, that is not an easy insight to come to, let alone to embrace. I realized, listen to what I was saying to you. I needed that person. I needed them to be a certain way. I needed them to say certain things. I needed them to act a certain way. And if they didn't do what I wanted them to do, act the way I wanted them to act, say what they wanted to say, that somehow that made me less significant, that somehow that made me less su successful, that somehow that meant I wasn't fully okay. And the, 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 this is the shock and the awe of, of idolatry. Not only was that eating me alive, but to also play the other side, the, in, the revelation that God gave me in, in the, my idolatry is not just what it was I was doing to myself, but I wasn't allowing that person to be who they were in Christ. I wasn't giving them that freedom. I was suffocating them and trying to make them to be who I wanted them to be, who I needed them to be. And that is just wrong. That's not right. You understand whether it's a relationship, whether it's a thing, the job, what we worship in place of God bears the seed of our own destruction. Are you hearing that? And when we self-destruct, when we try to look for something else for salvation apart from God, not only do we self-destruct, but we actually impact others directly or indirectly. We hurt them, we wound them, we crush them. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. I don't know if you've experienced it. But what we have here today, through the message of Micah, the Lord is offering us a means of grace, a word of warning, an opportunity for correction. Just as street signs warn us of potential danger, right? Slippery when wet, children at play, falling rocks, construction ahead. God wants to spare us from driving off the fast approaching cliff. Proceed with caution, Micah says. How do we do that? How do we heed this word of warning? How do we seize this opportunity? We read Micah and Micah offers us guidance. And it's the standard prophetic prescription. It's a single word, repent. And you've heard that word before, right? That's that churchy, that churchy loaded word, repent. But what I want to break down through what Micah shares with us in chapter one is how, what repentance really looks like. Repentance begins with recognizing the problem. I had to recognize my idol. I had to be able to see it. 
a warning that is not perceived as needed will not be heeded. And we have to start by paying attention and reflecting and confessing the idols in our life. You've got a Kairos card, you've got a, an insert here. You might mentally do this in your head, but let's face it, what I'm about to take you through, if you don't take advantage of this, it's not like you're gonna go home later and go, you know what, now sounds like a wonderful time to reflect on the idols in my life. <laughs> you will not do that. But this is your sacred space to listen to what I'm about to take you through, and no one else has to see this, but for you to let God show you the idols that are in your life. We all have them. Nobody, <laughs> nobody, we all have them. And it starts by recognizing the problem. So ask yourself, reflect, where have you become so attached to a feeling, so attached to an experience, a habit, a choice, a person that you are ignoring the warning signs around you? I said we have a tendency to ignore warning signs and the question is why do we do that? Why do we ignore warning signs? And the answer to that question will help us to further unpack our idols. Why do we ignore warning signs? Well first, we ignore warning signs because we think we know it already, right? Why don't you listen to the airline announcement by the flight attendant? Because you've heard it before, right? You know it. Ask yourself in your life right now where you believe you know it all. Where you are beyond correction. And specifically, I would encourage you to reflect on matters of pride, matters where you get stubborn, matters where you get starting to feel superior, right? Maybe you even can think of situations where you've insisted you're right, you're wrong, and they're wrong, where you insist you're right all the time. And specifically, if you really want to target a potential idol in your life, think about those places, those relationships, those situations where it's not only that you insist you are right, but if you're really, really honest, deep down, you have to be right. And if you're not right, you're angry. If you're not right, you get depressed. You might have a potential idol right in front of you. Why don't we pay attention to the warning signs? Sometimes we're like, well, I know it already. I got this. But other sometimes we don't pay attention to warning signs because we don't take it seriously, right? It's not really a concern to us. It's not a big deal. It's, not, it's no big, yeah. oh, yeah, 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 I know. No big deal. We don't believe it applies to us. We can handle it. Think about those places in your life where you say, I got this. I can handle it. It's not a big deal. And reflect on the fact that big problems in our life start as small defects or bumps along the way, right? A distant attitude just starting to give a piece of one's heart away to something or someone else is what ultimately ruins a marriage, is it not? Using a person as a means to an end. You didn't mean to do it, you know, it wasn't intentional, it wasn't premeditated, but you used someone as a means to an end, right? You took, taking someone for granted is ultimately what destroys a friendship, is it not? And it's a fine line, and we all dabble here. It's a fine line, so fine that sometimes we're not sure which side we're on. It's a fine line between regularly enjoying something pleasurable. Alcohol, shopping, gambling, working out, surfing the net, whatever. It's a fine line between regularly enjoying something pleasurable and needing that high, needing that hit in order to focus. It just helps me focus. In order to function, I, in order, I, I can't do this unless I have this. In order to follow through. Beloved, where do you think the rules don't apply to you? We all have those spaces where we're like, ah, that, that doesn't apply to me. That's your problem, not my problem. Where do you think the rules don't apply to you? Where right now in your life, you may be even hearing the voices in your head and they may be voices you don't want to hear. Where right now can you hear voices in your head of someone, multiple people who are cautioning you, expressing concern, pointing out hazards, and in the midst of those voices, you hear yourself just making excuses, right? Just self-justifying, just plain denying reality. If you're really willing to go there, honestly look at all those places in your life where you're being defensive, where you're self-justifying, where you're denying reality, where you're insisting you're in control. But the truth is, if you're really, really honest, and I mean honest just with you and God looking in the mirror, you really know that in the midst of you insisting you're in control, the truth is you've really become a victim. You've become a slave to your own desires. You don't know how to stop. You don't know what quitting looks like. You don't know 
where that line begins and ends that we just talked about anymore. You have become unhealthily dependent upon a relationship. You are finding your sense of self. Your significance weighs heavily. Your sense of success is absolutely tied to this. And you may have an idol right in front of you. Repentance begins by recognizing, by naming our idols, confessing them. But then repentance means letting them go. I talked about that relationship in my life. The, the, harder, the hardest part was recognizing it. I did not want to face it. But let me tell you what was harder than the intellectual space of recognizing what that relationship was, what it had become. What was harder was letting it go. As it was, not letting the relationship go, but letting it go. Many of us, you right now can walk out of here and we've gone through an intellectual exercise where you've maybe on the perimeter defined, written down, and acknowledged idols in your life. But if we don't go beyond recognizing them to letting them go, they will just come back into your life. And how do you know that you've let them go? Because once you've faced your idols, once you've confessed them, you begin to mourn. It breaks you. When you allow the idols in your life to become dismantled, good things to be put back in their proper place, bad things, things that are not good for us to be uprooted from your life, you will grieve. You will grieve the consequence of your choices. You will feel the pain of withdrawal. You will confront the fear of letting it go. And that's how you'll know because you'll be afraid to let it go. You can't go on. It won't be the same. When you experience that, when you feel your brokenness, when you grieve the consequences of your choices, when you allow yourself not just in intellectually but emotionally to experience the reality of your brokenness and I'm, I'm right now <laughs> I haven't told you anything about who this person is but I stand before you feeling extremely naked and vulnerable even though it's not currently an issue for me that's what I'm talking about where you are standing before another person before your God and you say you acknowledge not just up here but in here you're not okay everything is not fine you need help. We all need help. Again, I've said this a couple weeks ago. If you are in here and you don't think you need help, what are you doing here? We all need help. I've heard this said. Some of you know this, and I think it's true. Anybody who goes in for treatment for drug or alcohol abuse will not kick the addiction unless they are willing to be in treatment. Right? You can name your idols. You can see them, but if you're not willing to let them go, if you're not willing to grieve, to mourn, to be broken, they will remain. And you may go cold turkey, you may turn your back on them, but you will be back worshiping them again. They will again rise above your relationship with God. What I'm saying to you from personal experience, is repentance won't happen if you don't hit rock bottom. And when I say that, that's very scary, right? Rock bottom. Oh my God, I don't want to hit rock bottom. We don't want to hit rock bottom. But my friends, hitting rock bottom doesn't mean you have to go crashing into a wall. Hitting rock bottom means reaching the end of yourself apart from the Lord. Some of you have given your life to Christ. You grew up in a Christian home, but have you reached the end of yourself? Have you hit Rock bottom, instead of trying to co-partner with God, instead of trying to continually climb yourself back up, instead of trying to work with God, have you reached that place where you realize you don't work with God? God's not going, man, I'm glad I have you as my partner. Don't know what I'd do without you. God says that as your beloved child, but God isn't saying, man, do your part, come on. When you hit rock bottom, it's when you stop trying to work with God and you just let God work on you. You let God work in and through you. Hitting rock bottom means realizing you'll never have enough if Jesus isn't enough for you. You'll never have enough if Jesus isn't enough for you. You'll never have enough money. You'll never have enough education or accomplishments. You'll never have enough friends. You'll never have enough compliments or praise. You'll never have enough power or influence. And the reality is hitting rock bottom isn't a one-time thing. We have to continually allow ourselves, because we always have a tendency of getting ahead of ourselves, like we say, right? Of getting, you know, getting, having a higher opinion of ourselves, right? All these expressions we have. Hitting rock bottom is a regular thing of being brought back down to earth, 
To realize God is in heaven and you are not. To realize God is God and you are not. To realize other people in your life that you're trying to make into God cannot be God. Hitting rock bottom is a repeat experience. And again, being confessional, I would love to tell you, I shared my one story about that relationship and that's never happened to me again. I have never made another relationship an idol in my life. I'm a liar. <laughs> I'm a liar. We're wanting to do it. I would love to tell you that different things that have got, taken my attention, my focus, my imagination, my creativity, that have taken it above my relationship with God, oh, been there, done that, no longer an issue. It's constantly an issue for me. It's always an issue for me because my, my heart wanders, my mind gets distracted, my will is in the process of being straightened and, and worked out. Idolatry is always before me, so I continually have to allow myself to hit rock bottom. And again, hitting rock bottom doesn't mean I have to go slamming into a wall. That's what God doesn't want to have happen to you. Hitting rock bottom is reaching the end of myself. And one way or the other, you reach the end of yourself because you know this, right? You know this. Resources dry up. You know that, right? Right? Health and strength will fail. You know that, right? Titles and opinions will change. You know that, right? Power and influence will diminish. You know that, right? People will disappoint you and let you down. You know that, right? All that we idolize will end up taking more from us than it gives. And in the end, no one gets out of here alive. And our idols die with us. But today's Epiphany Sunday. We gather together not as a people without hope. We recognize our idols. We grieve them. We let them go, but we do not do so as a people without hope. We have a lifeline. When we repent, when we recognize our idols, when we face and mourn over them, when we hit rock bottom, the end of ourselves, that leads us back into right and healthy worship. It leads us into the arms of the one looking to, relying upon the only one who can lift us up and give us new life. The only one who can heal you and make you whole. The only one who can fully satisfy and truly fulfill you. Everything else may crumble, and it will. Everyone else may not be there for us, and there's times when they won't be. But the Lord will never leave you or forsake you. The Lord will never leave you or forsake you. He speaks through the prophet Micah as a father to his children, but he has not turned his back on his children. He is begging his children. He is pleading with them, don't do this. Don't do this. And as we go further in Micah, they're going to do it. And that's not where God's going to go. That's it. Done. God's going to go even farther. And we know this. Because our God has come to us in Jesus. Beloved, our God comes to us in Jesus because when we hit rock bottom, he wants us to rise. Rise from failure. Rise with forgiveness. Rise from the dead. Rise beyond ourselves. Rise to eternal possibilities in Christ. It's worth mentioning, Micah delivered this message, this warning from the Lord multiple times. I don't know if you know this. The first time he offered this word of caution to the northern kingdom of Israel, and if you know your Bible history, you'll know that this warning was ignored. Through the raising up of the Assyrian Empire, the judgment of the Lord came to pass as the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom in 721 B.C. Once Samaria fell, this northern kingdom, 10, think about this, 10 of the original 12 tribes of Israel were carted off to other lands and functionally all but disappeared. And God's warning came again through Micah as the Assyrian Empire then turned toward the south. But despite, get this, despite witnessing, they saw it with their own eyes, the fall of Samaria, the people of Judah at first did not pay attention I talked to you in chapter one about how Micah lists those cities, those towns, those small towns and villages that he's a part of. Part of it is to show how insidious idolatry has become in the land. But the other way you can look at that listing of cities is that listing of cities by Micah is the invasion route by which the Assyrians marched right up to the, the gate of Jerusalem. They went through each small town and village right up to the gate of Jerusalem and then something happened. As the doom Micah warned about actually came and stood at the gate of the city, someone finally took caution. Someone finally paid attention. And it was King Hezekiah of Jerusalem. Hezekiah faced reality for his people. He didn't shoot the messenger named Micah. 
He didn't deny what was about to happen by saying, hey, let's eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow we die. Hezekiah didn't run for cover and try to get away from what was knocking at his door. He didn't beg the Assyrian Empire for mercy or try to negotiate a deal. Hezekiah repented on behalf of his whole kingdom. He confessed the idols of his people and tore them down. He led his people in mourning over their brokenness and he put their lives in the Lord's hands. You can read more about it in Isaiah 36 and 37, but what happened next was a miracle of history. The mighty Assyrian Empire was defeated and Jerusalem did not fall. Hear this. One kingdom, the northern kingdom, ignored the Lord's warning and disappeared from history. The other kingdom, with judgment knocking on its door, finally took caution, heeded the warning, repented, and endured. Are we paying attention? Are we listening? If you're not with me here, these next couple of weeks are going to be painful. But I pray that we would receive the book of Micah not as detached observers, but as engaged and responsive people. Harsh declarations of God's judgment may not be what you crave or want to hear. Can I just say, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to preach it. But Micah's prophecies are here because they are a word of caution for us as well. Most people don't pay attention to warnings and it always costs them something. And what Micah is going to show us again and again is how we choose to live with or without God shapes and impacts the course of our lives and our future. And how we choose to live or not live before the Lord also influences and affects others around us. Our choices have consequences. Idolatry in all its forms is a lie. In God alone, in Christ alone, we find the truth. We will either be consumed by our lies or the truth will set us free. Prophets like Micah will continue to give us a word of caution, but not as an opportunity to fade away, but as a call to repentance. And when we pay attention, when we recognize our idols, the lies that we create and worship, once we face them, once we release them, once we mourn how they've broken us, broken us down, broken us apart from each other, we can be set free. Do you want to be set free? Because the more warning of Micah is a message that danger is ahead, but it is also a message of hope. It's an invitation to freedom. Because when we hit rock bottom, the end of ourselves, the epiphany comes that we can begin to rise, not by our own strength or will, but by the grace, the truth, and love of the one true and living God who has already given us and all the world the ultimate miracle of history by coming to us, by dying for us, by saving us all in Jesus Christ. Amen.